Welcome to Blitzscaling a Startup. Chris, this is, uh, oh, wait, I have to do a thing. I am Julian. And I am Chris Ye. I think it's Hi, funny, Chris. by the way, that you don't give your last name and I do. Well, I think there's just uh, a lot of Chris's. There are. But, you know, it's not like Julian is this wildly uh, unfamiliar name, like in the old days when Shaquille O'Neal first came up. Right. Obviously, there were very few other famous Shaquille, so it's very easy to know. If you said Shaquille or Shaq, you knew exactly who people were talking about. Well, maybe I should I should uh, start doing that. Um, the uh, oh, As you know, we interviewed this guy, Dan Daniel Pink. Um, yes. And... I noticed his website is danielpink.com. So I asked him, hey, how do you want me to refer to you as? And he wanted me to refer to him as Daniel because that's kind of his brand, Daniel Pink. Got it. Well, that is funny. Obviously, I know him as Dan because I know him personally, but uh, I respect people. Like, you know, I always tell people, I'm going to call you what you want to be called. So uh, my friend Charlie Hudson decided eventually, you know, he's gotten older very famous let's go by charles i'm like charles it is whatever you want me to call you that's what i'll call you so we are talking about a oddly appropriate for us topic which is should startup founders and specifically ceos mm -hmm. um create content or not and you may or may not know, like I pretty much never created any content until we started this together. Like, yeah, I think I, I'm pretty sure I, just, I never even posted on any social media. Uh, like I, I, I'd even have the password to my Twitter account. Um, so I, and I still don't have the password, to my Instagram, um, I need to, uh, well, I, I don't, I'm not going to say what I need to do because somebody could steal my Instagram handle, but uh, <laughs> since this is public, but um, I just never created any content at all to the point where dedicated my last business had a podcast and I was not featured in it at all. Um, so my bias has been to not create content and just mm -hmm. not be part of any content creation. Uh, my reason for that was it was a distraction and I should be saying my time on other stuff. Like that was just it. I hadn't thought about it beyond that, mm -hmm. but I'm not really sure if that's the right move. And that's what I wanted to discuss. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll let you give, give me some high level thoughts. Absolutely. As always, you know, in this podcast, we proceed with nuance and try to analyze things deeper because a simple yes or no question often cloaks many different components. And when it comes to the question of whether a founder should be a content creator, it really gets to the question of, well, what does it mean when we say content? What does it mean when we say create? Because that actually masks a whole assortment of things. Let's start on the content side. So obviously the kind of content you create matters because not all content is created equal. So for example, uh, if you, Julian, came to me and said, for my purposes as an entrepreneur, I would like to start doing experimental artworks that are underground and they're anonymous, I would say, oh, that's certainly content creation, but I don't see the connection to what you're trying to do. So when we talk about content, we're talking about content that serves a specific purpose. And it may be that thematically it ties in with what you're trying to do and if not, then I start to question it. So for example, you know, if, if I'm a venture capitalist and I start a blog that is all about the television show Masters of the Air, which is now coming soon from Apple TV Plus, please Apple, sponsor this podcast as well. That may or may not be necessarily that helpful. Uh, for example, I created a, a fair amount of Ted Lasso related content, another wonderful Apple TV Plus show. Apple, please sponsor this episode. And it was not something that would necessarily be useful for work purposes. That was done more recreationally. And so I think that it's okay to create content recreationally, just don't expect to do it for business purposes. So the content itself needs to be 
relevant to the audience that you're seeking to influence, and it needs to be a high enough quality. Right? Creating bad content doesn't help you. Just creating a bunch of content, I mean, maybe it helps you a little bit from search engine optimization because the computers couldn't tell whether something was well-written or poorly written, but it doesn't help you if it's not good. And so I think that those are the key things along the lines of the content. Now, what that content could be, again, that's going to vary based on the audience and the purpose. Uh, obviously, you could create a podcast, a YouTube channel, a TikTok channel, a LinkedIn newsletter. There are all different kinds of content you create, and there's no one that's better than the others. What you should just be doing is trying to figure out, okay, where is the audience that I'm trying to move? And let me make sure that I choose the right kind of content for that side. So before I get onto the creation side, why don't we pause and give you a chance to react to what I just said about the content? Yeah, so my, here's kind of what would be helpful to me. So mm -hmm. assuming I can create content that's super relevant, like maximally relevant, maximally easy to create, you know, check all the, the boxes, right? So, so I, I do this like totally optimal content. Yeah. I do it really well. Yeah. Um, wouldn't there be a case that I should just not do it anyways because I'm just not like I, I, I like I have other things to do as as a as a CEO. Well, I'll give you my perspective on it, and of course, it's biased since I am a content creator by choice and by career. But the way I describe it is that your content is always working for you. You sometimes hear these you know, terrible financial gurus or self-help gurus who I hope all fall into a pit and die talk about the importance of generating passive income. And they're technically correct, but always the way they're seeking to generate passive income is some horrible scam that they're trying to steal your money. If you want passive income, invest in dividend stocks, right? There's no way to supercharge it or find a free lunch. That's the best passive in income you can get. And it's relatively low, which is why telling people I'm going to build massive passive income by building a huge network of apartments that I own is like, yeah, great. Uh, all you're doing is levering up. And if you happen to lever up the right time, you'll make money. If you lever up the wrong time, you'll go bankrupt and be destitute for the rest of your life. So passive income, I hate. However... The notion of passive income in the content sphere is, well, it's passive influence, right? I am asleep. I went to South Korea last year and the people who were there as the organizers said, hey, would you be willing to record uh, something for our friends? And our, their friend had something called EO, not Entrepreneurs Organization, but its own EO network sort of media company in South Korea. And so I went over had to take a, a cab and so it took like you know 45 minutes and then i sat there and shot video for like an hour and a half and they packed me back on a cab and i went back to my next appointment and so it was an investment of time it was a little inconvenient to get there but i shoot these videos and they have sliced them up and the most popular one has had i think over a quarter of a million maybe over three hundred thousand, maybe even over four hundred thousand views and people have been telling me, oh, you're, you're very famous among the technology field in, in Korea because of this. And so that's something where, you know, I worked for an hour and a half and I had this commute time around it. So it's basically investment of three hours of time to completely change my chat, uh, profile in an entire country. Now, that's an extreme case, but it's an example of how content works for you even when you're asleep in the old passive income phrase. So I think that that is the key, right? You want to get beyond the point where you can only accomplish things when you're actively working on them. You want to set up those things that are going to go out into the world on their own and work on your behalf, even when you're not there. And that's what my entire career is about, the content working on my behalf so that when I actually see someone face to face, there's a decent percentage of them who are already fans of my work, who deeply understand it, who therefore know what I find interesting and what I believe. And it shortcuts everything. It's a sense of relationship in advance. So the people are very excited to meet me and it gets the relationship off to a great start. So again, I think content is enormously powerful. It can do things in a way that basically nothing else can. And it is an enormous extension of your own personal brand and relationships. So I'm all for it. So I think the example you gave is also an example of another dynamic around content that I've been 
noticing as we create our own content, which mm -hmm. is that you get benefits like doing it for longer is kind of like compounds on itself yes so, so in this example you like it's true you only spent three hours to record this piece of content and it got you all this um you know visibility but the reason why you're able to do that is that you're already in korea doing some other form of public speaking and the reason you're in korea doing that is that you'd written this book and the reason you wrote this book that became popular is that you'd written another book um and um so there's this kind of like compounding effect yes. uh that happens in content creation uh you know an example of that in our podcast is like at first we were struggling to get guests it was hard to convince guests to come on now it's really easy you just send them like past interviews they don't even check anything else they're just like oh other people in my caliber have been here therefore social um, proof is a powerful thing and uh, yeah, so, so, so I guess, can you, how does that play into things if you're a founder? So let's say right yes. now I have, I'm doing this channel with you, but let's say if I hadn't been doing it and I said, Hey, I'm just going to start creating content. I mean, is it actually worth it knowing that the benefits will come in a few years and you, you actually just don't have the time as a, as a CEO today to do that? Yeah, and I think that that is a legitimate argument. I think that if you are truly flat out and you have no time and this requires you to now sacrifice an extra however many minutes or hours of sleep per day, it's probably not a good idea. But I think you've hit upon something very important, which it is something that compounds, but it compounds not just with uh, investment of your time. It also compounds with elapsed time. And yeah. so there is no way to well i suppose if you have enormous resources you could do this but there's no way to sort of say hey i am going to suddenly go full time on content for the next month and i will record a bunch of content and i will push it out there and i'll be a mega star right if you're rich enough to just buy billions of dollars of ads that might work or buy a social network or something like that but Otherwise, it won't because, as you pointed out, you put out content, it takes a while for it to find its audience. You put out content, and the fact that it's out allows you to then get better guests and things like that. There's all these ways in which it compounds. And so the advice I often give to people is before you get into this content game, make sure that you actually enjoy it, that it is something that fits with what you want to do because you are likely to spend your early days working away, putting things out, getting very little feedback in return. And you're going to have to either have made a decision to invest your time or be willing to invest your time just because you really enjoy it. And in the case of blitz scaling a startup, clearly we had to do a lot of work in the beginning and it was very much harder in the beginning. It was not as rewarding because we didn't have as big an audience. We didn't have all these famous guests coming on. But now it obviously seems to have been worth it in the long run. Uh, but we had to have had the conviction that it would be, and in my case, the willingness to invest the time in it simply because I enjoy doing it. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really been like I'm really happy with what I've done with content here in the sense that I had nothing to do anyways for the last year, and this was a really good use of my time. Um, and then. I enjoy talking to you and that's the main thing that I do. That's right. Um, so it's a, uh, you know, net positive just from that perspective. If it was just me creating content on my own. I might, you know, not, well, I wouldn't do it. It's just too much. I, I just don't like doing it. Um, but if it's just talking to you, it's a lot of fun. And when we interview guests, I'm meeting really interesting people. Like we did this interview with, uh, it's called Daniel Pink, um, that I was referencing earlier. And I learned, you know, things that got, that were really useful to me from, yeah. from talking to him. So, so I enjoy that. And then as, uh, you know, one of our, uh, guests was, is coming to LA for the Grammys and then wanted to get together with us. He kind of like a networking thing. So it's like fun. And so, so the way I, I've, I've ended up doing it is really fun for me. And I had the time to do it and I had nothing better to do. Um, and, and I think that 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 worked out. Um, yeah. By the way, I want to point out, you know, this was something where a year ago we were just starting off. No one even would know who we were. I mean, again, we have the ability to leverage whatever notoriety or fame I have. 
but you know there was not a lot of reason for people to pay attention other than the content but by building and building it over the course of this year we've been able to actually build something of value and again it's very much like investing because it is an investment and in investing the keys are be consistent start early and those principles apply here as well. Be consistent, start early, and be willing to stick with it as opposed to somebody who's like, oh, I put some money in the stock market. It didn't immediately go up. Forget that. I'm never going to do that again. Yeah. So, so I think one of the takeaways is kind of, you know, whether you're a, a startup CEO or not, you have to think of content as a long-term investment that you're going to have to like continue to invest in um, you know over a long period of time and you know you know one of the dynamics that comes out of that is maybe it doesn't make sense to start producing content as a startup ceo um, if you haven't done it before are, are there other you know actionable things from that, <laughs> that, 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 that for for startup founders i try to say ceo because i think it's yes. more like there, there are a lot of different types of founders but it doesn't have to be the ceo like any like super active um uh, well, full-time founders i think a big question is is this actually something that's a strength of yours right it's not a one size fits all and to be a content creator you have to enjoy creating the content but you also have to create content that people enjoy and I'm now going to refer to this as the Ron DeSantis effect. So I don't know if you followed our American election process, but the governor of Florida, Ron DeSantis, recently dropped out of the presidential race. And I commented that one of the reasons why Ron DeSantis dropped out is because there were apparently a decent number of people who were interested in the idea of Ron DeSantis but the more time they spent with the actual Ron DeSantis, the more repelled they became. And so guess what? If you are putting content out into the world, people have to actually like that content. And there are people who are not good performers. Maybe they're a monotone speaker. They're just really boring. They don't really end any pizzazz. Uh, and I can tell you that most venture capitalists fall into that category, right? One of the major competitive advantages I have in the field of venture capital is that the audiences at these various conferences that they find wildly more interesting. And so I attract a disproportionate amount of attention, even away from people who are much larger in terms of assets under management and experience and things like that. So you have to ask yourself, is content creation actually a competitive advantage? Or am I subject to the DeSantis effect? Now, I hope that all the readers, listeners, watchers of our content are, in fact, people who are wildly charismatic and interesting to others. Um, they certainly show good taste in content themselves. But it's important to note that you have to decide and find out. Look at the things you've done in your life. Are you naturally interesting to people? Or have you? can you find a way to be naturally interesting to people? Because if you are not well-suited to this, investing things in content is not good. Or if when people learn more about you and your content, they're going to be repelled, that's probably not a good idea. So, but, but how, so how do you know if you're a fit, like if you're interesting to other people? So let's say for me, I, I'm not even convinced that I'm that much of an interesting person um maybe i am i'm just not that self-aware but uh you know i if you somebody had asked me whether like if if i had been listening to this podcast two years ago and i listened to it i'd be like yeah that's a good reason for me not to create content because i'm not particularly interesting like i'm not uninteresting i've done like a tv interviews and i was you know in politics and wasn't like horrible and i did you know I'd win the public speaking things in elementary school, but like, whatever. I don't have like, I don't think I'm that, you know, interesting to watch. Um, so assuming that you think I'm interesting enough, uh, you know, how, how do you like, like, what's the meaning to get from that? Yeah, I think that the thing is, as with all things in life, you're going to have to get some practice in and get some feedback. 
So uh, I think, and by the way, if you can do it live, that's the best of all, because you can't fake that feedback, right? If you're speaking to a live audience, they're either going to be interested or they're not. And you'll probably be able to tell. And if you can't read that level of human emotion and interest, that is also a sign that this is not for you. Uh, I speak to audiences and I instinctively can tell whether they're interested or not. And I will control things and move things in different directions. And as they say, read the room or uh, adjust on the fly. And that is a big part of it, right? You get that feedback loop going and you may not have that immediately. And Julian, I think what you're saying is you've listened to old podcasts that you did and you weren't as polished and as effective in those early podcasts. But you improved because guess what? You know, you are a very smart and capable guy. And I had no doubt that this would ultimately be very interesting. Yeah. Okay. So it's kind of what you're looking for is like, do you think you can figure out how to do this in a manner that's sufficiently interesting? And also, do you have the ability to read the audience, to get the feedback? Do you feel like, oh, I can really sense what's happening here? Or you're like, I have no idea. I have mm -hmm. no clue what's happening. Which again, is a, a sign that maybe your natural aptitude doesn't lie in this direction. Yeah, well, and this touches on something else. Like I found, so you're really, really good at a lot of things, but one of them that actually gets to you know, the core of what, where you're, you know, where you excel is you're really good at interviewing people. Um, Thank you. And, and, and there's just a lot that goes into that. And you're, you're definitely a lot better than me at interviewing people. And the closest thing from doing this uh, content to kind of real time feedback, I guess, kind of like the rapport with the guests, yeah. right? If you do the guests and you see, if you talk to guests, you see how they, how you come off. Yes. Um, and I've really learned from you and, and also like listening to other people's contents, like uh, uh, interviews, how to just be better at uh, interviewing folks. My, the, the point I'm trying to make is those skills are actually transferable to lots of other areas of life. Yes. Um, so in a way, and I'm interviewing someone for our podcast, it's, and a lot of the kind of underlying logic or kind of like fundamental truths about other people that make it that 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 make a good interview are the same which make a good like VC pitch or um, you know call with a somebody on your team. That's um, right, and. You know, how would you think of content creation as a skill, like as a way to develop you, skills that are useful yeah. more generally as a startup CEO or a startup founder? Absolutely. So content creation is a different way of saying storytelling and your ability to convey a story, whether it's in written form or whether it's in spoken or verbal form or even in visual form. And the reason why content creation is so powerful is because these days, thanks to the internet, we are able to get feedback on our content. So it's all about learning. No one is born inherently great at this sort of thing. You know, there are all sorts of experiences along the way. Maybe you happen to be fortunate like me to be born relatively extroverted to derive energy from seeing others, uh, maybe blessed with a, a rapid, uh, rapid reading and strong memory. All these things are helpful. But at the end of the day, everyone can get better. And that's by practicing and having feedback that allows you to learn from that feedback. And so creating content gives you that feedback. And you may not get great feedback at the beginning, but don't let that discourage you. Instead, say, wow, I'm getting awesome feedback that is helping me get better. And the fact that I'm getting this feedback is going to help me get better faster. So it's not something where I'm like, oh, gosh, I've got to create some content and put it out there and everyone's got to love it or it says that I shouldn't do this. In fact, the fact that you're getting feedback and suggestions and people who say, oh, I think you should do this, I think you should do this, that's actually great. Now, bear in mind, 
there's no rule that says other people's opinions are actually correct. And so at the end of the day, you have to evaluate those opinions and decide whether or not you agree with them, decide whether or not you agree with the reasoning behind them. And that, of course, is the meta message of blitzscaling a startup in general, which is to actually understand the mechanisms of action behind success or failure. And to then be able to pull those levers more effectively because you understand them instead of frantically button mashing like an inexperienced video gamer. So the thing where I like I thought about this quite a bit um, because, you know, it's like the question for me is like, should I continue to create this content when I like as I you know get more serious about selling my business? And I think the thing where content creation has been most helpful to me, and I think is most helpful in general, is recruiting. Yes. Um, like there's just something, I don't know if it was like this 10 years ago, because I, 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 I didn't create content, but, but I think it, it, there is, it, there were some dynamics like that. But it's like, there's just something very charismatic about media. Um, that you can leverage for recruiting like it just adds credibility right um in the eyes of people who would otherwise not be excited about working with you um it's uh you know people are excited to get involved and help you with your content in a way that they might not be with a startup um you know how, how would how do you think of the role of content creation in recruiting? It's probably something that you've worked yes. on, like that, that you've benefited a lot from uh, as well. So, absolutely. And so, you know, there are two different and separate mechanisms of action that are occurring, both of which are important. The first is you're giving people much more information on which to make their decision. So if somebody wants to say, oh, should I work with Chris Ye? There is so much content and information out there that they can just take it in until they get to the point where they feel comfortable versus, well, this is a very secretive organization. Nobody's ever seen the face of this leader. And now I'm being called in and asked whether or not I want to work for this company based on a 15 minute conversation with this person. There's just a lot more uncertainty and you're going to have less confidence in making that decision. So the first principle and uh, value creation vector here is the ability for people to feel like they have sufficient information to make that decision. But the second is it is a, a, a practical demonstration of your ability to invoke an emotion in that person. Uh, we make decisions emotionally, not just rationally, as much as we'd like to think we make decisions rationally, emotions play a major role. And just as we would do with a marriage, uh, going into a working relationship requires you not just to have a set of bullet points about why it's a good idea, but for you to have chemistry with the other person. I think that, for example, if you were to, I don't know, Julian, we actually haven't talked about how you wooed your wife, but I don't know if you sat down with a PowerPoint presentation or a memo listing the various solid reasons why you would be a good spouse and she looked them over and said yeah that makes sense let me do some due diligence and then we can close this deal i don't think that that's the way it worked i think it's far more a question of people asking themselves hey when i'm around this person when i'm listening to them when i'm speaking with them how do they make me feel uh, i was just in the bahamas at an event speaking with you know, many enormously wealthy and successful people, some of whom came from multi-billionaire families and the like, they obviously have been exposed to a lot of things in their lives. But what is really relevant in terms of my business is how do I make them feel when they're talking with me? Of course, they want to take in information from me. But then the question is, how do they feel taking in that information? And I think that one of my friends and business partners who is there described it as, you know, the vibe that you have, Chris, is that you are everybody's favorite kindly professor, right? You are able to sit down and explain things in a way that makes people feel smart rather than stupid, that makes them feel like they have a much deeper understanding. And that also causes them to have very favorable impression and very warm feelings towards you. 
probably because it's reciprocal because I have warm feelings towards the people who I'm talking with. I'm trying to help them understand and I naturally treat them with empathy and sympathy. And so I think that that's the other component of the content creation. The content creation allows you to create emotions in folks and those emotions will then lead them to make decisions perhaps differently if they just look purely at the facts, but in all likelihood, they'll help them make a better decision. Yeah, it's kind of like, I think what you're saying is if somebody's already before they meet you, they, they have seen content or consume content with you, uh, with you in it, right? So whether that's reading your book, whether that's, um, you know, watching interviews with you or whatever, uh, listening to your podcast, um, then it's like, they already come in. It, it, it's like, where do the emotions come in? It's like, they already have an emotional correct to you. That correct. Is, yeah, I'll give you an example. There was a younger venture capitalist who was at the same event in the Bahamas. And she saw that I was going to be speaking. That was one of the reasons why she was there. And she had actually brought her own copy of Blitzscaling that she'd bought back when it came out. Uh, you could tell it was an older copy because, you know, book pages sort of yellow and deteriorate a little bit over time. And it is one of the ones where it has been worn down a bit from reading. And she had carted it across multiple continents. And of course, I signed it for her. And part of it was that it worked to my benefit because she already had a pre-existing emotional relationship with me. And she actually helped us out with some very important information that may help us accomplish some important things. But then it also made it very easy for me to like her, right? It, 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 the fact that there was this content-based relationship made it easy for us to then have a personal relationship. And so it is a booster rocket or booster chair for relationship building if you have that content out there and people are consuming it because it will jumpstart the emotional process. Instead of having to wait to get to know the person, feel them out, you're immediately able to jump in and just start building. Yeah, th that is totally true. Where it's like you want to so say in a world where there's so many people for you to know and meet and you want to build relationships with them like you do want to feel connected to them you want them to feel connected to you um but it's hard to do that because you don't have enough time to build a connection with, yeah. with everybody but if they already come in with something in common with you which is that they have watched or consumed your content in some manner it's i mean they already have an emotional bond to you that's been created and then you can easily create this kind of reciprocal right. emotional bond and, and i'm thinking back to when i first met this guy jack layton who is the um, uh the leader of the political party i worked for uh he, he'd since died of cancer but mm -hmm. i remember i'd already seen him on tv um i already kind of knew of him and i met him he walked in and he just seemed like this kind of like surreal figure and I was really impressed to meet him. And like the fact that I was impressed is obvious. And he was happy that somebody was impressed to meet him. Absolutely. Who doesn't um, like, you know, basking in the adulation of others? My goodness. Well, I introverts, but you know what I'm yeah. saying. So it kind of like creates this, you know, relation, like immediate emotional bond between people. I never thought of it that way, but, but I think that's, that's precisely correct. But it is also very important to note that therefore, what the content you create should reflect who you actually are. Because if you have one persona in all of your content and then they meet you in person and you're very different from that, that may prove disappointing. Right. And this is one of those famous sayings, never meet your heroes because you see this version of them and then you meet them in person. Now I personally have felt that what happens when you meet your heroes is they're truly heroic because you walk away even more impressed because you understand that they deal with all the same human frailties and problems that the rest of us do. And yet they somehow find a way to transcend them. That's part of what makes them heroes. So you must make sure that the content you create obviously seeks to put you in a very positive light, but it's still ultimately authentic because if people are disappointed when they meet you, well, again, that's the DeSantis effect. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That is really interesting. Uh, okay. Well, let's, uh, 
I think what, when we started this, you had, you kind of asked me for input and I, yes. uh, I, I, I went off on uh, well, this long uh, discussion. There was an, uh, some other stuff you wanted to. Yes. The second point through, right? is the, the second point is the creation side of things. And so if you think about the content as the thing being produced, that is the work product, then obviously the creation side is the input. And the question becomes, okay, how can you make that creation process also work for you? And part of that is, does it leverage your existing assets and knowledge, right? So, and ironically enough, this is what made it a little more difficult for us to, at least me, I think you had much more grounding in this, to become the number one Afrobeats podcast in the Zet sense, which is that it's not an area where I had huge knowledge before. And so required me to spend some time coming up to speed and watching videos and really getting to know the, the genre. And when you don't have to do that, it's a little bit easier. But then the other element of the creation process is, okay, as you're doing this, when you're producing this work product, are you also producing other things that are useful along the way? And that could be, in the case of our podcast, strengthening relationships with fascinating, interesting, important, and powerful people. It could be improving our thinking and thought processes, which is one of the main reasons I do this. Julian, as you know, I've said many times, the reason we do this, or at least my motivation, is that you ask good questions and you cause me to think things or realize things that maybe I knew unconsciously, but had never articulated before. And so looking at the creation process itself to figure out, is this something where it is efficient and effective? And is it something where it's producing benefits on its own, even if the content is never consumed by anyone else? That becomes a key part of the question as well. Yeah, so it's kind of, so the question is, you know, if you're creating content and creating just the act of creating that content is valuable, that's definitely a net positive. But, but like, how would you, like how valuable does it need to be to make it as a startup founder something that's worth your time because i'm just like remembering to what my life was like yeah. a year and a half ago right like time for me now is just very very different than it was back then i have a lot of time like think about things like yeah. write up my thoughts on stuff uh, one of the reasons i never created let's say i never even posted on linkedin which is you know a, a social media i use i mean i i use it mostly connect with people but I could have posted, there's nothing stopping me from posting, except I didn't because I was just like, I had so much on my plate. And now I, right. I do post on LinkedIn, I post twice a day. And the reason is I have nothing else to do. So I just like think about things and I write up my thoughts. So, um, and, and I do find this valuable, right? Cause it puts clarity in my, yeah. my thinking, but you know, to, like what is valuable enough to be worthwhile when your time is super, super limited. Right. Well, ultimately, like everything, it comes down to a cost benefit analysis that you're doing where the benefits can include non-financial benefits like you enjoy doing it and where the costs can include non-financial costs like it consumes my energy to do this. And ultimately, yes, it's harder for an active startup founder to justify doing this. However, if you all want to make this happen, again, it's going to help your startup, right? There is, if you are making content that appeals to the audience, which could be your users or customers or investors or employees, it is having a concrete impact on your company. And again, you have to watch out for the DeSantis effect. It has to be content that is relevant and of high quality. And the creation process, hopefully, is relatively low cost and actually bringing some benefits on its own. But yeah, there you could still ultimately say we are busier than a one-legged man in an ass-kicking contest, and there is no time, and I just can't do anything. And that's true for me as well, right? During certain crunch periods, there is much less content that I write, or there is content that is going out there, perhaps it's coming out of my mouth at an event, but I don't have time to capture it and make it into something that can go out and spread on its own. 
So even I sometimes choose not to make content, even though I could. I mean, the number of things that I could write or record is nearly infinite, and yet I don't do all of it. And that is because there is a cost and a benefit involved. Okay, one of the things I've noticed is when you're super, super busy, you I, I notice like let's say you're uh, your podcast, like Chris Ye podcast, you don't publish yeah. to it. Um and uh there's other content you just don't do when you're too busy. Right. But That's you right. typically still do this podcast. Okay. Yes. And, and obviously part of that is you know your commitment to me. Yes. But my assumption is that, and here I'm trying to kind of get the, the learning from this. Mm -hmm. And hey, I really appreciate that. It, Thank you. And you notice that you, um, you know, prioritize this. But I assume part of it is since I'm driving it. Correct. Uh, you kind of just show up and it's like an hour of your time, which is an hour of your time, but it's really different to spend an hour on something versus have to like drive an initiative. Correct. So, so is there some tactical takeaway here if you're a startup founder and you'd say, okay, I want to create this content, but I want to create it in a way where there's someone else, you know, someone else's proactive energy pushing it, not mine or something like that. Yes. No, I think that, that you're spot on. Uh, this is what I describe as the power of external willpower. So willpower, as you know, is an exercise of executive function. And executive function is something that is not unlimited. And again, no matter how productive, intelligent, no matter how much CrossFit you do, it's still limited to a certain extent. We are not robots. And executive function is based on the glucose that's available to your brain. And then when it chews through that glucose, it has to revert to other forms of nutrition and it's no longer going to be as effective. And so it's physiological that this happens. And the funny thing is that, again, executive function is required when you are actually executing, making decisions, exercising that willpower. I don't need to exercise willpower for this because since it is already on the calendar, we are leveraging Google Calendar as external willpower because I don't want to disappoint you, Julian, because I value our relationship. It drives me to make sure that I'm here. And then finally, uh, the, it's, it's the part I get to do the part that is to me, the most rewarding, which is to have that conversation with you. There is a whole bunch of other stuff that then goes on in the editing, in choosing the thumbnail pictures, in writing the description, in publishing, in promoting, and doing. And those things are all important as well. But they do not offer the same immediate feedback and emotional juice that talking with you does. And so what you've done is you've made this process as easy as possible so that it consumes almost zero executive function for me but at the same time produces endorphins and so it's like oh just imagine it's like hey there's this drug that i'm taking that makes me feel good and has no bad side effects and is trivial easy i don't need to shoot it into my vein all i have to do is click a link and clicking a link makes me happy and energized well gosh of course i'm going to do that over and over again and therein lies the opportunity because if you are able to provide that to someone else, then it makes their life a lot easier. I mean, look, in some ways, that is a, a, a much smaller version of the role I serve for our ultimate patron saint, Reed Hoffman, who is full of amazing ideas, has no time to execute on all of them, and is able to, by working with me, have far many, far more best-selling influential books than he otherwise would have. And part of that is it makes part of that is that the interactions that lead to those books are then fun, enjoyable, do not tax Reed's executive function. Reed doesn't have to come in and prepare a bunch of things in advance, although he sometimes tends to jot things down. Rather, he just has to answer questions and take part in a conversation that I hope he enjoys. Much like we do here. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think the kind of like service that you do for Reed and the service I do for you here. Uh, actually, the service that we're in some way doing for Reed here by, um, you know, putting out his brand. Um, although he helps us by retweeting us. So that's uh, absolutely. And that is a big thing as well. I mean, Reed's reach is remarkable. Uh, right. Like having like if you're a founder and you're able to get 
somebody to do that for you. Uh, that's super valuable. I think the other takeaway is, you know, the way that Reed gets you to do that is by having you be a co-author. And the way right. that you get me to do that is by having me be a, um, uh, you a know, co-host. Co -host. Yes. So there's kind of like some learning there. But I think the other learning is you are naturally inclined to do that. And also kind of like sufficiently experienced and sophisticated to know that you have to do that. Like Reed doesn't have to tell you like, hey, look, if you want me to invest like time into this and do this with you, you ought to make it really easy for me. Like he never had to have that conversation with you and you just knew what was up. And, you know, similarly, you know, like I take care, like I like purposefully set everything up to be like as simple uh, yes. as possible for you. Um, and you never had to tell me to do that. Like, I just, I understand that that's how it has to be done. Correct. And very few people in the world understand that type of hierarchy. Um, uh, you know, this, and, could be a, this could be a whole topic, which is just make it easy for people to work with you. And that's something I've in understood instinctively from the time I first entered the workforce, which is just, I always tried to package it up and make it as easy for other people to just say yes to what I was proposing. And, you know, it was funny because people, I, I remember this is actually the subject of something at my first workplace, D.E. Shaw and Company. Uh, they, we had a very, well, as, as they tend to be, sort of prickly VP of engineering who uh, you know would like to say no to things? A very classic sort of situation. And he talked to my boss, and he said, "You know, why can't everyone be like Chris? He's so easy to work with." And my boss said, "Well, you know, the, the funny thing is, part of what's happening is Chris is doing a bunch of the work for you in advance. He's already talked to people. He's already got the sense, the lay of the land. He puts it all together, and all you have to do is say yes. And that's why he's so easy to work with." Right. It's not just a matter of, oh, he has a winning personality. It's that he does the work and makes it easy to just say yes. And if people are looking for more uh, of a breakdown of this, they can. Well, maybe we should discuss that in a hmm. future episode, but they can also go to our brand new podcast feed. Uh, if they just look up an Apple podcast, Spotify interviews from Blitzscaling and Startup, they will find it. And there's an interview there with. Daniel Pink, and uh, he and I, one of the things we discussed is that we were both uh, political sappers. Mm -hmm. And I asked him about this. I said, like, have you found that you have this kind of like inability to see yourself as the principal? And you kind of like just default because your first job is as a political sapper. You default as seeing yourself as being like in service of others. Uh, and we had a long conversation about that because he had the exact same experience as me mm. um, where, you know, he started as a political sapper. He was a speechwriter Al Gore. Um, Funny and... thing, let's let's also promote something else. We're going to cross promote. So Dan, Daniel Pink was a speechwriter for Al Gore. And our upcoming interview with the great Nancy Duarte will be with the woman who designed the PowerPoint presentation yeah. and drove An Inconvenient Truth. So... I guess maybe what we should do after having interviewed Daniel and Nancy is maybe we should go get Al Gore as well. Yeah, we should, we should ask them. That's a good idea. But yeah, like and actually to link it to Nancy's thing, it's kind of like, like a really Nancy's whole thing. What we'll be talking to her about with her is kind of like putting the other person as the hero of mm. the story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's kind of like you are not Luke. Right, your customer is a loop. Um, Skywalker, that I is like one. Yeah, exactly. Sorry, yeah. So in Star Wars, Luke Skywalker right. is the the hero, and like m many people think of themselves as Luke of their own story. But there's like this power of like putting others as the principal, putting others as the hero of the story, um, and that's something I like comes so naturally to me because I worked for seven years as a political staffer where I wasn't the hero. Right. Like yeah. nobody cared about me. And to the extent they did, they cared about me as the as, you know, the Obi-Wan Kenobi or, you know, whatever. Oh, actually, uh, yeah, that, that's that's far too much. We get far too much shine if we're Obi-Wan Kenobi. It's more like Biggs Darklighter. 
Luke's childhood friend, who most of his scenes are deleted from the movie, sadly. Right. They shot various scenes that more deeply explain the relationship. And who, in the end of the movie, sacrifices himself so that Luke can complete his mission. And then, sadly, no, very few Star Wars fans uh, even realize who we he know. is. And yet, you can argue, the rebellion wouldn't have succeeded without Big's Darklighter. Because his influence on Luke led Luke to have the desire to help others and right. to be a part of the rebellion and his sacrifice allowed Luke to destroy the first death star. Yeah. It's, it's such a powerful thing to do to. So, so I, I think the thing is, if you are a startup CEO and you're um, looking to start content, maybe a really good trick is to find somebody who will let you be Luke. Cause mm -hmm. it's just like so much more emotionally, um, easy to be uh you know the person who gets all uh, gets a spotlight and has all the fun but doesn't have to do you know the hard work um like that's just so much easier and if you're like constrained for time constrained for for energy which all ceos are uh that might be a trick to be able to do it and actually pretty natural in a content creation content yeah. and by the way you know as with all things this is a problem that could be solved with money I have a number of friends who have podcasts of, of different types. Um, obviously, the most famous is Reed Hoffman and Masters of Scale. Reed doesn't produce Masters of Scale. It's produced by Wait What. His friend June Cohen created it. And there's an entire team of dedicated people who works very hard to make it happen. It still requires more of Reed's time than it would be ideal just because that's the nature of life. But he doesn't have to, uh, he doesn't have to be the driving force. And the same, but the same happens at multiple levels, right? Maybe you are not Reed Hoffman and have such a degree of fame and influence that somebody would build an entire company around you. But there are also agencies out there at a lower level. My friend Ramit Sethi is very famous for his book, I Will Teach You to Be Rich, and his Netflix show, How to Get Rich. And his podcast was a podcast where he went out and he hired an agency to help him with it. Now, he had the driving vision behind what he wanted to do. But he didn't want to learn how to do sound engineering and his team did not include sound engineers and all those kinds of folks so he hired an agency they've done a phenomenal job with this podcast which is great and that directly led to his netflix show and then finally at the level of i talk about like sort of cosmic superheroes and then street level superheroes at the street level my friend tim taylor has a podcast called the father daughter dance it's about a topic he really cares about which is the relationship between fathers and daughters. It eventually led him to doing a one-man show off-Broadway. eventually is leading him to creating a book on the topic. And he found a single podcast consultant in Australia that was relatively inexpensive to help him put that together because he didn't want to learn how to do all the sound engineering and all the other work. So these are problems that you can solve, and they can work at any scale from the street-level superhero to the cosmic superhero. Chris, it's been super insightful. Thank you for your time. Uh, I'll, uh, folks, you can subscribe um, on whatever platform you're listening to this on, and please leave us a review, leave comments, like. Uh, we're on Twitter. Uh, we're on LinkedIn. Hey, we now have, Chris, we now own the linkedin.com slash company slash blitzscaling. Um, Very cool. URL. Uh, and then uh, we're also at blitzscaling.fm. Um, so uh, please go and find us on whatever platforms you use so that you get uh, alerts when we do live streams and um, you can participate. Awesome. So Julian, you, as always, such a pleasure. I'm now off for a week of vacation in Hawaii, but I will return in time for next week's episode.